Welcome to the Fundamentals of Ultrasound Physics Lecture Series, brought to you by the Ohio State University College of Medicine. This lecture is going to be on Doppler instrumentation and colored Doppler imaging. The outline includes discussion on Doppler principles, pulse versus continuous wave Doppler, spectral analysis, Doppler circuitry and processing, concept of aliasing and the Nyquist criteria, color flow imaging, as well as power Doppler. We'll first start off talking about the Doppler principle. What does that involve? Primarily, Doppler effect is a wave phenomenon. It's associated with electromagnetic energy, radar, and sound. It describes the frequency shift between the transmitted ultrasound echo and the received echo, and typically manifests in the audio frequency range. Three players are involved. You need a medium for sound transmission, you need a source, and you need a receiver. You will get a Doppler shift if you have a source and receiver moving in opposite directions, or you have one source moving one stationary, vice versa. You will have no Doppler shift, on the other hand, if the source and receiver are both stationary or if they're moving in the same direction at the same speed. You've all heard about how the Doppler shift is heard when you wait for a train, when you hear an ambulance drive by, and that's all well and good. But in this lecture, we're going to give you a new perspective on Doppler shift. Assuming you're in a racetrack, where the engines are completely quiet. The only thing you hear from this race car traveling at 115 miles per hour is that it is emitting a middle C tone at 262 hertz. Now when the stationary observer hears this note or this tone as the race car drives by him, which is a moving source, he will listen and he will hear that the frequency is actually much higher than middle C. In fact, it is D sharp. Now, as soon as the race car speeds past the observer, who again is stationary, and the source is moving away from the observer, the tone that the observer listens to will now downshift to a frequency of 220 hertz, or an A, as follows. Now heuristically, you can think of the sound waves that are being bunched up, as shown in schematics, as the race car races towards you, the stationary observer, and therefore giving you a high frequency. Now as you speed away, as the car speeds away from you, the stationary observer, the sound waves are further apart uh, at the tail end, and therefore uh, you can kind of get the sense that the frequency will be much less as it moves away from you. Let's do a question to test your knowledge. Under what situation can a Doppler shift be zero between a moving source and a moving reflector? Is it choice A, same velocity, opposite direction? Is it B, different velocities, same direction? Is it C, different velocities, opposite direction? Or is it D, same velocity, same direction. Let me pause the tape to think about your answer. The correct answer is D, same velocity, same direction. Let's construct a Doppler equation from scratch. Here you have a characteristic wave equation incorporating Doppler shift, where the frequency uh, of the receiver, FR, equals to a fraction uh, multiplied by the source frequency. Now V sub R is the receiver speed, and V sub S is the source speed of the wave and C is the speed of sound within the medium, in which case it's 1540 meters per second for soft tissue. After some manipulation of diffraction and also using calculus, we deduce the bottom equation, which can further be approximated as the receiver frequency equals the fraction times F sub S. If you minus F sub S from F sub R in approximate, you have the shift frequency is F of S, source frequency times the velocity divided by the speed of sound. Well, how do you apply the Doppler equation? Well, in the clinical setting, the probe provides the source of the sound waves, and the red blood cells are the receivers. The ultrasound echo reflects off the red cells, which now act as the echo sound source, while the probe takes turn as the receiver. As the signal goes back to the uh, echo transducer, then a Doppler shift is detected from the difference in the frequency uh, between the transmitted pulse and the received pulse. 
for a Doppler shift, it's important to remember that the source frequency in the clinical setting is typically unchanged, but that the perceived or the received frequency is either increased or decreased due to the shortening or lengthening of the distance of the receiver. If we use baseball as an example, if the pitcher pitches at a certain rate and the catcher uh, catches the ball, he would have the same rate that he perceives that the pitcher is pitching at. Now suppose the pitcher moves a short distance towards the catcher after each pitch, then the perceived frequency would be different. Let's say a pitcher throws 100 miles per hour, say he's from the Cincinnati Reds, and he throws a pitch every 10 seconds. So the source frequency for the pitcher point of view is 6 hertz. Now from the catcher's point of view, he is catching the ball at 6 hertz as well. So perceived frequency and the uh, source frequency are the same. But as the pitcher advances towards the, f the catcher by a few feet after each pitch, the frequency the perceived frequency of the catcher in terms of what the pitcher, how fast he's pitching, uh, how often he pitches, is increased. So this is what we call the Doppler shift or the beat frequency. So in the result, the perceived frequency of the catcher is now greater than the source. So FR is greater than FS. And this difference between FR and FS constitutes the Doppler shift. And so we have our first incarnation of our Doppler equation that we described earlier. F of D, the Doppler shift is V over C divided times F of S. Now the Doppler equation so far is not complete. You're still missing several components. The next component that you incorporate is the angle of incination. Let's take a blood vessel, for example, populate with moving red blood cells. Ideally, if you have a uh, transducer, right? at zero degrees facing directly into the vessel, that is ideal. Parallel probe angle. However, in real life, you have body surface to contend with. So your probe, uh, realistically, has to be at an angle versus the blood vessel. So in this case, let's say you put a dorsal channel probe in the belly, looking into some of the abdominal arteries, you have an angle of formation uh, that is formed between the, uh, the line of sight of the probe versus the uh, line of direction of the vessel. It's called theta. This theta forms a Doppler angle of incination, the cosine of which needs to be incorporated into our Doppler equation as follows. So, so right now, f of d is v over c times f of s times cosine theta. Now we're not done yet. Now during Doppler measurement, recall that the Doppler effect occurs twice. First time, instant ultrasound beam reflects on the moving red cells. And second time, reflected beam goes back uh, into the transducer, forming a round trip effect. And therefore, adding a factor of 2 completes our equation as follows. So all the components are listed in this equation, so you can use this equation from here on out as our final Doppler equation. f of d equals 2 times v over c times source frequency times cosine theta. Let's do an example. The probe frequency is 5 megahertz and flow velocity of the blood cells is 5 centimeter per second and the angle of incination theta of 0. Calculate the Doppler shift f sub d assuming the speed of sound is 1540 meters per second. Is the response A, 33 hertz, B, 130 hertz, is it C, 325 hertz, or is the answer D, 3000 hertz, 3.3 kilohertz? You may pause the video, figure the answer, and resume when you want to see the response. The correct answer is C, 325 hertz. Here's how you do it. F sub D is 2 times the frequency, 5 megahertz, times the speed, times cosine of 0, which is 1, divided by C. If you use the approximation method, you can see that the approximate answer is 5 over 1.5 times 10 to the 2, or the answer is approximately 300 hertz, which makes choice C the closest answer. 325 hertz is the final answer. Unlike BMO imaging, in which 9 degrees gives you the best signal strength, in Doppler measurement, if you measure at 9 degrees, you get zero signal due to the cosine term. Therefore, for the best compromise, 30 to 60 degrees is best. Now here's why. The cosine angle curve shows a strop, steep drop off in signal when you approach the 50 degree angle mark. Therefore, for practical purposes, you want to measure at no more than 60 degrees. In addition, if you measure at 60 degrees or more, the percentage of error as a function of the angle is increases dramatically. So despite uh, measuring even at less than 60 degrees, you're going to be looking at a minimum of 10 to 20 percent of error in the best case scenarios. So as a 
key point summary here. Given the Doppler equation, higher the source frequency gives you a higher shift, smaller the angle gives you a higher shift, and the higher the blood flow velocity also gives you a higher shift. The limits of Doppler shift is the follows. It only predicts the frequency shift. There is no information on signal strength, intensity, or power, and there is significant error associated if you measure Doppler signals above 60 degrees. Let's end this segment on a question. Which of the following Doppler angles results in the highest frequency Doppler signal, assuming all else being held equal? Is the answer A, 30 degrees? Or is it B, 45 degrees? Or is it C, 60 degrees? Or is it D, 80 degrees? As you know, the answer is A, 30 degrees, because cosine of 30 gives you the largest number for this cosine factor. All else being equal, that gives you the highest Doppler shifts.